Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasure to be with you again here today, uh, worshiping our Heavenly Father with you. Just a couple quick announcements. One, a reminder that if you wish to give to the church, we have a box in the back corner. And if you're online, you can give at ChesterGospelChurch.org. Um, and also, I got word tonight that for the children's uh, uh, martial arts ministry, not only are you going to learn some wonderful Bible lessons, but Lucas might try to teach you how to do a tornado kick as well. So, oh, I think we should, should uh, set an important rule. Uh, kids, you're not to be practicing this on your parents or siblings. <laughs> Self-defense purposes only. <laughs> like that's going to stop them. <laughs> All right. All right, well, with that, let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning, and yes, Lord, for this time. God, sometimes when we pray and we say thank you for a moment, Lord, we, we pass over those words too quickly. God, each day with this body of believers, Lord, is a treasure and a blessing. The morning that you've given us today is a gift. Lord, what time you may elect to have us to have next is equally a precious gift and hope. God, I pray that as we go into your word today, Lord, that we will do so with humility and a spirit ready to learn your word and, Lord, to grow deeper in our relationship with you. Amen. Amen. As we are journeying through the book of John, I found this chapter to be hard to read. Not because of grammar or the Greek or the Hebrew or anything like that, but because of how dark and lost everyone was. And how when you look at Christ standing before Pilate, and then the Sanhedrin there as well, we see Christ, he is the source of life and salvation for all of them. Yet, Christ did not receive comfort from them. He did not receive mercy from any of them. Instead, Christ became a pawn to, be, to attempt to be played with at the center of their politics, at the center of their religion, at the center of their egomania. And through it all, Christ was made to suffer because their lives were marked not by Christ, but marked by their sin and their merciless nature. That Christ even was able to take that upon himself. So as we go through this passage, I want you to remember this brief introduction that I just shared with you. Remember these things about the lack of mercy shown to our Savior Yet Christ did that willingly for our sakes, that he took that upon himself. He even took that upon himself when he went to the cross. So if you would please turn with me to John 19, <coughs> and we're going to be working through verses 1 through 16 today. John 19, verses 1 through 16. And yeah, I'm going to be pausing and moving uh, throughout this passage, so bear with me. Uh, but as I read and we work through this together, remember that this is the word of the Lord. Amen. John 19, 1 through 16. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Let's pause for a moment. In last week's message, we saw the discussion between Pilate and Jesus Christ, and the questions that were being exchanged, not only between Christ and Pilate, but also Pilate and this growing crowd on his front porch in the middle of the night. And while the crowds were hoping that they could push and leverage Pilate to give a quick trial and an equally quick execution of Jesus, 
Instead, we saw Pilate not only recognize that Jesus was innocent of any wrongdoing, but we actually begin to see Pilate attempt to save the life of Jesus. Now, this is kind of interesting that right after Pilate recognizes Jesus' innocence, that then he sends him to go to be flogged. <clears throat> Why would Pilate flog someone that he just declared innocent? Again, I tell you this is because Pilate is actually trying to save Jesus. In his first attempt to save him, Pilate gave the crowd the option to choose between Barabbas or Christ to be, a re to be released according to their custom. But the crowd did not choose Christ, they chose Barabbas instead, the man who was known to be a felon, a thief, and even a local terrorist. And they chose him over Jesus Christ. And now Pilate flogs Jesus. Why? Here's the reason. Because if Pilate could not secure a freedom from punishment for Jesus, perhaps he could at least save Jesus' life with a punishment close to crucifixion. So in Pilate's mind, if the Jews wanted to punish Jesus so badly, perhaps if he gives Jesus a punishment that not only brings Christ close to death, but also humiliates him in such a degree as to prove him nothing but a man, and the Jewish leaders are wasting their time, perhaps the Jews would feel justice has been done. Now, I do not know Pilate's motivation in this circumstance. If it was because he wanted to show himself as a merciful or a strong leader, or to show that it made no sense for the Jews to manipulate him to do this, or perhaps he was truly trying to simply save a person who he thought was an innocent man. Whatever the case may be, Pilate is genuinely making attempts to both save Jesus and try to get Jewish leaders to back down. But I don't want you to consider Pilate trying to save Jesus necessarily the act of a good man. Just because he's trying to do something that may appear to be good does not make himself someone that has genuinely good motives. Because Pilate was not a good man. He was an egotist that believed in himself and working situations that served himself best. And as you're going to see later in this passage, he might try to save Jesus to some degree, but his lack of mercy and the humiliation that is directly attributed to Pilate and the Romans upon Christ can hardly seem to be judged as a good thing. And before we continue in this passage, I want to remember that Several people have tried to save Jesus so far. Peter tried saving Jesus once before, and then Christ corrected him. And Pilate has now tried as well. But throughout John's testimony, remember this important fact that John has been trying to make clear to us throughout the entire book. Christ prophesied that he would die and rise from the dead. It has to happen. Because if it does not happen, Christ would be both be a false prophet, even less so than being the Son of God. Christ is the bread of life that will be broken for you and me. Christ is the gate through whom we have everlasting life. Christ is the light of the world, that though the world is committed to the darkness and the deception of sin, Christ is light and life incarnate as the Son of God, the great I am. Christ remains in the driver's seat of these circumstances, as we will see when he talks about his authority and his father's authority. And as he continued to give himself as a free gift to save us from our sin. So yes, Pilate on the outside may be trying to save Christ, but I ultimately think Pilate is more about serving himself and proving the Jews wrong in the hopes of making himself look mighty and powerful. And because of this, because of the selfishness of Jewish leaders against Christ, and Pilate's desire to utilize Christ for his ego, Christ is in the middle and becomes the embodiment of all mockery. Pilate's objective is through a merciless punishment, which will not only humiliate Christ, but will also bring dishonor to the Jewish leaders from moving forward with the task of trying to execute Christ. 
And he hoped they would back off to save themselves from further embarrassment. Yet, here is Christ taking all of this upon himself willingly for you and me. D.A. Carson in Pillar's New Testament commentary, he worded it this way. He said, here is the man, Pilate speaking with dripping irony. Here is the man you find so dangerous and threatening. So he's talking about Christ has been beaten, thorns, robe on his back, and he is presented to the Jewish leaders. And in a mocking tone, this is what Pilate does, he mocks the Jewish leaders in how he presents Christ to them. He says, here's the man you find so dangerous and threatening. Can you not see he is harmless and even go as far as to make it appear ridiculous? And if the governor is thereby mocking Jesus, he is ridiculing the Jewish authorities with no less venom. But the evangelist John records the event with still deeper irony. And here indeed is, yes, the man, the word made flesh. All the witnesses were too blind to see it at the time, but this man was displaying his glory, the glory of the one and only Son. In this very disgrace and pain and weakness and brutalization that Pilate has advanced as suitable evidence that, he was a, that Jesus was a judicial irrelevance. And yet as we know what the world intends for evil God will intend for his good. Right. Mm -hmm. On to verse 5. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Let's pause again. The first time Jesus came and Pilate presented him, he called him the king of the Jews. And now he calls him the man. But the tone from Pilate is one which is essentially is antagonizing the leaders. As if to say, I am right and you are wrong. And so while Pilate, yeah, might be trying to look like he is saving Jesus, it is more about Pilate having a political struggle with the Jewish leaders. He's saying, yeah, here's the guy that you said would be king and up against Caesar. Look at him now. I'm right, you're wrong. And the Jews catch this. The Jewish leaders catch this. And they respond in like in verse 6. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! So with little mercy, here's Jesus. Thorns. Memory serves me right. I believe it's supposed to be a, a fig vine of some kind. And the thorns are not just like little rosebush thorns. No, these are thorns that are inches in length. Bleeding. Out for everybody to see. And Pilate says, here's the man. No mercy from Pilate in how he's showing his evidence. And with little mercy... No mercy. The teachers of the law looked at this bloody and broken man and didn't even bat an eye. And they went straight to crucify him. They wanted Christ killed. And it would not matter what Pilate did. This would be their determination. Continue on. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. Wait, what? You need to realize this is new information for Pilate. This is the first he has heard this claim about him being the Son of God. This is new information for him. When the crowds first came to Pilate, it was initially because they called him a king in hopes of manufacturing this picture that Jesus is against Caesar. So then Jesus would have to be executed. But now they have called him the Son of God. What does Pilate do? Well, I can tell you, I'm certain that Pilate probably remembered his conversation with Christ. <clears throat> about how Jesus said, his kingdom is not of this world. And how those that know the truth will listen to his voice. 
So no longer was Pilate just navigating a simple case. The question came to him, but what if I am about to execute the Son of God? So what we're going to see is Pilate's going to restate the same questions as he did in the previous chapter about where Jesus is from. But I think it's remember for you to remember who Pilate is. You see, Pilate is not a Jew. He's a Greek. And I do not believe he was recognizing Christ as God. Rather, when he saw Christ as divine, he would see it being similar to other deities that he might worship or be superstitious about. For if he was a Greek, he probably had many gods. Some gods that were ranked very high. But they also had in their culture the idea of gods that existed and walked among them on earth. More than likely, Pilate was probably looking upon Jesus in, in that particular fashion, as if you might think of like, you know, Kevin Sorbo being Hercules or something like that. He might look at him in that similar type of fashion. But I can tell you this. Pilate can't deny that there is something more about this Jesus going on. Verse 8. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. You see, we see here that Jesus didn't answer directly the question about where he was from. One, well, he already answered that. And Pilate knew that. But two, he also knew that Pilate's real concern was about who would be held responsible for the judgment that's about to fall upon Christ. It wasn't really about where he was from. It's about what is Pilate expecting on the other end of this. In frustration with Jesus, Pilate calls upon himself as the authority over Jesus Christ. That if Jesus just would cooperate with him more, perhaps, there would be something he could do. But Pilate, remember, he's misguided. And he's arrogant about his abilities. And Christ, then what does he do? He speaks to God's sovereignty over the situation. You see, Pilate thinks his authority belongs to him. And it is for him to control his to maneuver. His to execute. But Christ here is stating that the authority that Pilate has is proven powerless. Because God will not allow it to work. That no matter what Pilate does, things will go the way God intends. Not the way Pilate intends. And then it becomes a humble reminder that no matter where our position is life, whether we are ranked high or low, whether we are deemed rich or poor, we all must answer to the one true God who is sovereign, the one whose authority never fails. If Pilate has any authority, it is because God has allowed it. And Jesus assures him the greatest sin in this entire debacle are those that turned him over to Pilate. And that is not to exonerate Pilate of his sins. As he has certainly committed many in this circumstance. But as far as Pilate is concerned, from his perspective, it gives him the ability to move forward in closing this court case, which is exactly what Christ wants him to do to move forward with his crucifixion. But Pilate was going to try one more time to save him. Verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Notice how quickly the Jewish leaders are switching back and forth between talking about Jesus as being the Son of God versus Jesus being a king. Back and forth, back and forth. It further points to the fact that they don't care their argument. 
Their hearts are so hard. They have so little mercy in them. They just want him dead. Verse 13. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now, when Pilate takes a seat, it's like the gavel coming down at the case. It means this is the seat of authority which is going to make its declaration. But there's another ironic twist here. The crowd that says that they are the people of Yahweh, that are part of the family of Abraham, the crowds begin to proclaim the name of Caesar as a challenge to Pilate freeing Christ. Now, Caesar actually portrayed himself as the son of Zeus. And he was known as a man that would swiftly remove any person that would even think of challenging him. They can consider their lives lost. So what this is, is this is a threat for Pilate to react to. So for Pilate to release Jesus at the disdain of the Jewish people, their teachers, their leaders, to release someone that though was innocent, that the people would potentially claim was a competitor to Caesar, then Pilate would be executed for allowing Jesus to live on. This was the trap of the Sanhedrin. Verse 14. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And Pilate, he said to the Jews, Behold, you are king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So now Pilate goes again, he changes from calling Jesus a man to calling him a king again. Because it's by that term that he accepts the Jewish leader's demands. That if he calls him a king, Jesus will be crucified. Just another twist. The people that have committed themselves to Yahweh are committing themselves to Caesar to execute merciless cruelty against Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Additionally, with no remorse or shame, Pilate uses Jesus again as a means of taunting his Jewish adversaries who have won the political victory over Pilate to get him to bend to their desires to crucify Christ. So Jesus is at this time surrounded by enemies. No mercy. He's going to be moved on to continual torture and crucifixion. And yet we see that Christ, even in his brokenness, is revealing, yes, his mercy and his grace, which he has extended to us. Yes, he is receiving all this malice upon himself. Sometimes we forget that this same malice is what is deserving upon us for turning our backs upon him. And how sad it is that the people now proclaim the name of a false god, even a heresy, and they take on the name of Caesar to get Christ crucified. So as Jesus is about to approach his crucifixion, what do we learn? What is John trying to share with us about Jesus Christ in this passage? Well, first, Christ's authority operates at levels that we struggle to comprehend. And it's far more expansive than many of us realize. Throughout Jesus' trial experience, we see everyone thinks that in some form or another that they have an authority that they call their own. Peter thought he had an authority to save Jesus. The Sanhedrin and teachers of the law thought they had an authority to execute Jesus and declare themselves more righteous than Jesus even in spite of God's commandments. 
Pilate thought he was a judge whose declaration of guilt or innocence was something he could uphold by his own means. But all of these cases we see that Pilate cannot keep the authority to his judgments. Only God can do that because he has already set a judgment against all of humanity. And Jesus is about to take that judgment upon himself the honor and glory of the Heavenly Father. The Sanhedrin thought they knew what honoring God looked like by their empty religious behavior. Yet, we see in their example, they called Pilate an enemy of Jews. They called him an ally. They called Barabbas more worthy than Christ. And they dare even call Caesar their only king because they wanted to manipulate and conduct the murder of Christ. Yet Christ has been the authority throughout this entire circumstance. He is the authority to save. Christ has been given the authority to judge. And it is by the relationship with Jesus Christ that one is considered righteous before God. Not of themselves, but by Christ. Too often, we see what we have, whether it is health, wealth, name, popularity. And we say, from that, I have authority. Yet, in humility before God, we cannot say we have authority of our own. Rather, we have humbly submitted ourselves to what God has called us to do. Now, authority and responsibility might be involved in that something which God has called to us. But it comes from God. He is the source. It doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from you. If we call it our own, then it will be considered like a curse to us. On the day of judgment. Because God will hold it against us that we did not honor him in what he has blessed us with. Second and third, we see that humanity's attempts to save itself or to save one another are less than useful. Without Christ standing in on our behalf, we're doomed. I pair these together because they really go hand in hand. All of us have sinned. None of us is perfect. All of us, at some point in time, have turned our backs on God. And to turn your back on God is to be like the Sanhedrin and the leaders that are calling to crucify our Savior. But to even try to replace God's work with our own work is equally evil because it requires that we ignore what Christ has called us to do and to be. So if Christ calls you to love your neighbor, but you choose to only love the neighbors that agree with you politically or root for the same sports teams, it happens. You're ignoring God. It is because of this that we cannot be trusted with our own salvation. Our own motivations often betray us. Our efforts will never earn us eternity. This is why we need Jesus Christ. Because he is the only one with the power, the authority, the authority, the mercy, the grace. The only one as the Son of God that has the right and the ability to hold it and keep it. And he's the only one that's able to establish a reconciled relationship with our Father. Amen. Now, I want to close with this story uh, that I got from Dr. Tony Evans. The story is told of a father who had five sons. The first son was an obedient child who loved his father. The four remaining sons were varying degrees of rebellion. One of the instructions of the father was to not go near the river because it had such a traumatic torrent in it. It was very dangerous. But the last four sons decided not to listen to their dad, so they all went down by the river and played in the water only to be sucked up by its current and pulled downstream. No matter how hard they tried, they could not get out of the water. They were pulled downstream for what seemed like miles upon miles until many miles later and almost dead, they were washed ashore a long way from home. They had enough survival skills about them to build a fire. And around that fire, they longed for home, but they didn't know how to get home. And they didn't have a way back to home. They remembered their father with fondness. They remembered how joyful things were back home and lamented 
over how things might have gone differently for them if only they would have obeyed. After a while, one said, said, I'm going to build a hut. I'm going to make the best of things I can right here. I'm going to call this home. The second son went over to the ridge to watch the first son build his hut, and he said, well, I'm going to stay here and watch what you do, because I'm going to tell on you when we get back home. I'm going to tell Daddy that you forgot about him, and I'm going to tell him that you forgot your real home. The third son said, well, I'm going back home. I don't know my way, but I'll just follow the bank and go back the way we came from. Now the obedient son had been sent by his father to look for his brothers. He ran into the fourth son first, and he told them that their father had sent him to find his brothers and bring them home. Now they had located one of his brothers. He wanted to know where the other three were. Brother number four showed him where the brother number one had built his hut. They knocked on the door, and the obedient brother said, Time to go home. But brother number one said, This is my home now. I've been away from Daddy's house too long. I've got new friends now and a new way of life. Thanks a lot, but I'm okay where I am. They went to the second brother, who was sitting down, evaluating the first brother. And the obedient brother said to him, Let's go home. Brother number two said, I can't leave here. I'm going to keep my eye on brother number one. If I leave, then there will be nobody to watch what he's doing. There will be no one to critique or judge him. They went on. The third son, who was busy making his way upstream. I like to think of this as a canoe trying to paddle upstream. He's getting nowhere fast. The obedient brother said, You don't have to struggle to find your way home. I've got a boat with a motor to take us upstream. And brother number three said, No, I've got to do this by myself. Because then I can go, get home to Daddy and show him how much I love him by how hard I've worked to get back to him. The father sent his son to bring everybody back home, but only one brother went home. Only one brother was willing to go home the father's way. The first brother got so comfortable where he lived that he was not willing to leave what he knew for the uncertainties of the trip back home. The second brother was so focused on somebody else that he forgot it was his sin that got him in the water in the first place. He didn't have to spend all his time looking at his brother's sin. If he just looked at himself, he could go home. And the third brother was so do-it-yourself, he felt if he tried hard enough, he could be free and climb home himself. It was only the fourth brother understood that the only way to get out of the mess he had gotten himself into was to follow the son who knew how to take him back to the father so he would be home again. So here's the question for you from that story. Which son are you? Who are you trusting for authority over your life and soul? For God the Father has sent Jesus the Son to save us. He is our Savior and Lord. If you're tired of the hut that you've made your home, if you're tired of being so focused on everybody else's sin that you've not yet gotten around to bringing your sin to the Lord, if you're so tired of trying to work your way back from where you're in, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to take you home to be with the Father. Yes, to trust in Christ in doing in the Scriptures that you might indeed be redeemed through Jesus Christ by faith, that you might have everlasting life. This is the perfect authority and love of our Heavenly Father that is shown to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Though He received no mercy from anyone, He has shown us the greatest grace of all. Yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We thank You. We thank You. God, many of us have memories of times where we were greeted or treated with hostility or a lack of mercy and empathy. And Lord, we know the pain that came with it. And yet your son willingly not only took words, but he took blood and torture and pain upon himself 
to show us to what degree He loves us, Lord. That if we trust in Him, yes, there is everlasting life. That He would take all that sin upon Himself and leave it at the cross. God, I pray for each person today, Lord, that struggles to relent our personal authorities to You. <laughs> Because, God, they are yours and for your glory. To trust in what you have done and in what you are doing. And that though we do not see everything, God, that you are planning and constructing around us, that, Lord, we can trust you and have peace through you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 3, 20, 21 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ, Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in the authority of Christ. God bless. <laughs>